I'm here to announce uh, that we are going to introduce legislation making Nexus uh, Work Act. Uh, it's legislation that would simply allow for virtual interviews uh, for new and renewing uh, Nexus applications. Uh, as we know, there has been a significant backlog in uh, issuing or getting uh, appointments uh, for a Nexus card uh, that was uh, 16 months last fall. That's been reduced to between 12 and 14 months, uh, but that's still too long a time. Uh, this is um, a pre-check, if you will. It's a, it's a pre-clearance uh, program, and it uses, it, we intend to use the technology that's available to be able to do interviews remotely. Uh, currently, under the leadership of Ron Reines, uh, who is the general manager of the Peace Bridge, there is a project ongoing, but it requires an individual to go through two interview processes, one on the Canadian side with Canadian Customs and Border Authorities, and then again on the American side with American Customs and Border Protection uh, agents. Uh, it's time consuming and has significantly impacted the wait times that is required uh, to actually go through the process and receive a, a Nexus card. Uh, Nexus was intended uh, to be a trusted traveler program uh, that would reduce waits uh, at the, the, the places like the Peace Bridge. And unfortunately, because of the backlog, uh, people aren't able to get the Nexus pass, and it's creating uh, significant time waits uh, at uh, the, the, the land ports of entry, uh, including uh, the Peace Bridge. Uh, but as I said, Ron Reines uh, and his leadership team here uh, undertook a, a project whereby uh, that's moving forward and it's had a meaningful impact on the time it takes to uh, make an application, uh, go through an interview process, and ultimately receive uh, a Nexus card. Uh, why is this important? Uh, the U.S. and Canadian economies uh, the Western New York and Ontario economies are deeply integrated. Uh, Canadians uh, spend uh, in 2019 about $20 billion a year in the United States. Every aspect of our life here in Western New York is tied to reliable, predictable access to and from Canada, uh, whether it's professional sports franchises, whether it's the retail economy. Uh, Buffalo Niagara International Airport, about 30 percent of people uh, flying out of, uh, of Buffalo Niagara International Airport are Canadian citizens, and the same is true with Western New York uh, and uh, Southern Ontario at least, but uh, 38 million people live in Canada, about 40 percent of those live in Ontario, uh, that is Fort Erie up through and including uh, the greater Toronto area. So the greatest inducement to travel is ease of travel. And uh, the U.S.-Canadian relationship took a hit over the past three years, 36 months uh, during the pandemic. And we want to get this back on track so that we can both, United States citizens and Canadian citizens, uh, enjoy the benefits of living in a border community. It's not only the economics that are important, it's also the life quality. So making Nexus Work Act will uh, allow uh, the virtual interviews uh, to take place, which should reduce the amount of wait times uh, people have to, uh, are currently experiencing as it relates to making application, doing their interview, and ultimately receiving uh, a Nexus card. So with that, I'll take any questions. Can you describe the typical Nexus customer? Is it someone who maybe works, lives in one country, works in the other, or is it someone who maybe just is a traveler who comes over the border a handful of times a year? Could be a combination of things. You know, a lot of people that live in Buffalo have summer homes, cottages in Canada. Uh, they're frequent users, and therefore uh, they get a Nexus card, which makes their weight uh, considerably less than what otherwise would be without the Nexus card. So I think there's a variety of users, and that's why the program was established. There's a separate lane. Uh, they have been, you know, pretty much pre-cleared, and uh, they're able to pass without a lot of weight. And, you know, if people don't respond well, the economy doesn't respond well to uncertainty and unreliability. And I think the Nexus card is something that serves as an inducement uh, to encourage uh, travel between the United States and Canada. Sir.
Yeah. Well, the update is that, as I said, under the leadership of Ron Ryan is here, uh, you had a dispute between the countries as to who could do what where. And the workaround, uh, and it's being demonstrated both here at the Peace Bridge, and where else, Ron? Thousand Islands. Thousand Islands. Um, you have two separate interviews, which is labor intensive, but it's also time consuming, where applicants can go to the Canadian side, be interviewed by Canadian officials, and then drive over to the American side. So that's two stops people have to make in order to go through that interview process. So this is a workaround that has uh, resulted in a reduction in the, uh, in the backup of, of Nexus uh, cards, uh, but this would uh, be something that would, you know, I think really have a major impact relative to expediting all this, this process. Well, I, ideally, this would replace the situation as it currently stands. However, uh, individuals may still have the option to do two interviews, but if you have an opportunity to do your interview with Customs and Border Protection from both the United States and Canada in a virtual uh, situation, uh, that would expedite uh, the application process and approval process. No, it hasn't reduced it to the extent that we would like it to. And that's why util utilizing technology uh, to do the interviews would, would be a much better uh, outcome. And uh, right now, there was a pilot project in 2019, uh, proof of concept, they call it, for the Trusted Traveler program, whereby interviews were conducted uh, virtually. I don't think so. I mean, obviously, you know, the pandemic, there were a lot of trends already in place, uh, but uh, they were accelerated uh, during the uh, pandemic because we couldn't meet in person. Uh, so I think the technology has gotten better. Uh, it will continue to get better relative to security. And I think it's a convenient way to utilize technology to reduce uh, the, the time it takes to apply go through the interview and ultimately receive a Nexus card. Uh, a 16 month wait is unacceptable. Uh, a 12 to 14 month wait, uh, we can certainly improve on that and by using the technology to do that interview and to get those, uh, to get those Nexus passes approved. Anybody else? Any other topics? Yes. Sure. Uh, so there, there is the thought to Inflation is not good for obvious reasons, um, and trying to curb it, I think, is, is you know, the effort that the Federal Reserve has undertaken. Yeah. It's worked, uh, not to the extent that we wanted to. So a further uh, I increase in interest rates, I would re request that uh, that be delayed until we see the full effect of what has already been done. Yep. Um, once they were starting to drop the COVID restrictions. Kind of where, where did you stand in that process? If, if there's been any movement in that process with re further reviewing border restrictions between the U.S. and Canada? Yeah, I think that uh, what typically happens 
uh, when there's a crisis, like 9-11, like the pandemic, you rather be safe than sorry. So I think restrictions are put in place, and then it's very, very difficult to pull those restrictions back. So we are reviewing uh, the restrictions that have been put in place in 9-11 and also the pandemic to find ways uh, like this, where we can utilize what's available to us today that wasn't available to us 20 years ago uh, that can make that cross-border uh, experience uh, better. Um, I think that there is still enormous potential that is unmet uh, for both Buffalo, the United States, and Canada <clears throat> as it relates to better use of the border and more efficient use of the border. It's kind of complicated, as we just experienced you know, 15 minutes ago. Um, and what people will do is they'll change their economic behavior to avoid the bridge altogether with too many restrictions in place. And we saw about a 40% reduction uh, in traffic between the United States and Canada during the pandemic. There was, there's a report that was out there with some concerns with migrants coming across the northern border, especially <coughs> more so in like Vermont and New Hampshire. But um, are there any further concerns? I mean, there's so much brought up about the southern border concerns, yeah. but you know, there are some inklings that the northern border, there could be people going back and forth finding their way without going through, you know, proper well, ways. Sure, that but, but well, I think that, you know, you have uh, border patrol and customs and border protection for a reason in both the United States and Canada. These are uh, highly trained professional law enforcement officers uh, that are, you know, develop skills instinctively and learned uh, that uh, make them effective in determining uh, whether or not somebody should be pulled over for additional uh, screening. Uh, those kinds of efforts uh, will continue. Uh, we want the border to be safe, but we want it to be also accessible to people that legitimately are utilizing the border for employment, uh, for pleasure, uh, for tourism, uh, all of those things that are very, very important to both economies. Uh, you know, Buffalo and Western New York probably wouldn't have professional sports franchises if we didn't have the added uh, fan base, ticket buying base uh, in Ontario. The Sabres uh, put that number at about 20%. I think the bills is a little bit hot, are a little bit higher. Um, but if you look through the economy of Buffalo and Western New York healthcare, Canadians spend $15 million a year uh, in healthcare in Western New York alone. So all of these issues, I think, are affected uh, by the border experience, and we just want to make it as efficient and as effective as possible, keeping in mind that safety is a major concern as well. Well, I would fight to uh, try to get that uh, elevated and not experience a reduction. Seems like they've already passed Yeah. Well, no, not really. And it's the dis distribution of those dollars once they become available. There may be a reason relative to uh, demand or less demand in certain areas that may have reduced uh, that. But I'll check into it, and we will do everything I can uh, to, you know, make sure that there is, you know, an ample level of support for that program. Senator, when you're introducing this piece of legislation today and the other questions that you've been able to address regarding access between both borders, do you, do you believe it'll ever get back to normal in terms of pre-pandemic levels or anything of, of those sorts, just getting back to a, finally a sense of normalcy without any COVID restrictions, any other yeah, I, I think that's a benchmark that we want to exceed. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I always believe that, you know, we do well uh, relative to the manager of the, of the Peace Bridge, uh, but I think we're doing it with one hand tied behind our backs. I think we can always do better, and it accrues to the benefit of both uh, Canada and the United States to have increased travel between the United States and Canada, and particularly at this, this, this peace bridge. So we're always striving, I'm talking with Ron on a regular basis, just to find ways 
uh, to improve access by use of technology, also infrastructure. You know, keep in mind that you have a, a peace bridge, which is three lanes, right? Uh, to move people between Western New York and a population center of 38 million people, uh, the largest uh, province in terms of uh, population is is Ontario. Uh, you know, Buffalo is connected to Grand Island. Uh, Grand Island is a place of about 20, 25 million people, and there are four lanes. So the challenge of making that experience as positive as possible. Uh, deals with, you know, efficiencies and proximity. So, uh, you know, getting that experience improved for people will induce travel. As I said before, the greatest inducement to travel is ease of travel. So always trying to find ways where, where we can improve. And we're finding that, you know, when technology is available and it can be used uh, for things like making Nexus Work Act, uh, we should take advantage of that. Uh, we should take advantage of infrastructure improvements uh, that are are being made at the, at the Peace Bridge on a regular basis to make that experience better. Any other under the radar sort of initiatives that you're hoping that the administration can, can make when it comes to ease of travel between the borders? Anything else that's kind of that you know maybe not be can be addressed now, but eventually once this can be addressed and this can be addressed, is there anything that's kind of like a, a longer term outlook? Well, if you're in a continuous improvement mode, you're going to find that those, you know, those opportunities, some of which we are aware of now, uh, like a project like this, uh, proof of concept is already occurring uh, under the Trusted Traveler program. Um, so anything planned, not immediate, but we're always looking for ways to improve that situation. Well, that situation needs to be corrected in, in as soon as possible uh, because uh, that's a problem. Uh, we know that uh, in older cities like Buffalo, uh, the infrastructure is not as good as it could be. And, uh, uh, you know, the replacement of, of lead pipes uh, is an important issue as it relates to uh, residential communities without, within, the, within the city of Buffalo. Uh, but this issue uh, needs to be dealt with as well because uh, that's a problem that uh, you know, our kids are going to be experiencing, and families are. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of upholding uh, the, uh, the pilot standards after 3407? Well, they're critically important. The, the National Transportation Safety Board uh, was dispatched to Buffalo the evening of the, the crash uh, nearly 15 years ago, and uh, they concluded that it was uh, pilot error was a significant cause of that crash. And uh, throughout a decades-long process, um, the minimum standards were put at uh, 1,500 hours. And there was a reason for that. Most people didn't know that there were two levels of safety, one for you know, the larger carriers, but also a lower standard for regional carriers that had the same name you know, Continental and United and Delta. Um, so this was through a process with a lot of testimony from experts that these two pilots should not have been in the cockpit that evening because they really weren't qualified to fly the plane. And we had an obligation along with the families who were extraordinary. I mean, they never gave up. <coughs> they were on Capitol Hill on a regular basis uh, to do something about it. So. I am concerned that with the change in House leadership, you have a chairman of the Transportation Committee saying he's not particularly uh, in agreement with the 1,500 hours. Look, that was, that's part of law now, and we will do everything we can to fight to ensure that it stays that way. And, you know, it's not coincidental that in that period of time, there has not been a major um, fatality as it relates to uh, commercial planes. Um, so I think it works. And these were pilots 
uh, would come in and provide testimony and uh, those people that are concerned about the flying public and their safety. So I think we have to ensure that that stays. There's no reason to get rid of it. I think that's used as, I think some have used this requirement, training requirement as a scapegoat for other problems in the industry. Look, airlines make a lot of money. Uh, they do very, very well. Congress's responsibility through the uh, Aviation Administration, Federal Aviation Administration, is to ensure that the flying public is safe. So you have this terrible accident in Buffalo, and the National Transportation Safety Board concludes that it was pilot error and issues of rest or lack of rest that were major contributors to that crash, you've got to do something about it. And if a Southwest pilot is required to have 15 hour, 1,500 hours of flight training, why shouldn't a Continental, continental uh, regional carrier have those same qualifications? I mean, they're not arbitrary. It's determined that that is a reasonable period of time within which uh, pilots get trained and are capable of dealing with uh, circumstances in the cockpit. You know, the families were extraordinary. These were people that lost kids, that lost mothers and fathers and grandparents. The first thing they said to me when they came to Washington was, we don't blame the pilots. We blame the policy that allowed those pilots to be in the cockpit when they weren't qualified to fly a plane. So I think the industry, uh, the airline industry, should work with Congress and not fight and try to reverse what took more than a decade to get done. It's not easy to change these rules. And you have to provide compelling evidence that you know this is something that's intended to remedy a problem out there and that's you know the potential for people that are not qualified to fly planes are flying planes thank you thanks much